Hi, this is Lynn Thompson. Welcome to The Storied Human. Today I get to interview my friend, Christina Rusiniello, who has a really fascinating story about leaving the corporate world, forming her own business, and making it work. So we're going to hear about how you do that. She owns Epona Pet Care, which is a boarding and training pet care business. They offer personalized service for all kinds of dogs. For the boarding, she offers a calm and happy environment so that dogs can enjoy being away from their owners and not get stressed. And for training, she helps develop that connection between owner and pet so that the training can take hold. She has a master's in animal science and she mentored with well-established trainers and continues learning in um, animal behavioral science. So she's got a fascinating background, um, very very much a dog lover, uh, but she likes cats too. And we're going to find out about how this journey started, how it happened, and what led her to leave the corporate world, because I think that resonates with a lot of people. So welcome, Christina. Hi, it's nice to be here. So good to see you good and to- hear you. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, so why don't we start with just a little bit about um, your background? Like, you know, I think you have a really interesting background. Your mother was born in Italy, mm-hmm. had a really tough childhood. Yeah. It really informed her and and your first generation. Yeah. And, and part of that, there's a lot that comes with that. Part of that is had always looking for greener pastures thing. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if you are in, I saw it with my mother and I did it myself. I mean, when I was, you know, in the corporate world and working in biotech, I used to go, well, this isn't fulfilling me enough. It's not enough. I want more. And so I realized much later that that's not a really common thing. A lot of people just go with it. I mean, they go, yeah, it's not enough, but you know what? It works. It pays the bills, whatever. And that never worked for me. And so. I felt like I had to do something different. And of course, the animals were a theme right from very early on. I mean, we were in, I was born in Newark and we were in a tiny apartment and I'm asking my mother for a pony. And she's (laughs) like, "Um, where are we going to put a pony? Like that's not going to (laughs) happen. So then I thought, oh, I'll be more reasonable and I'll ask for a dog. You know, so we finally did move out to the suburbs and we finally did get a dog and that did happen. Um, really young, like nine years old, I was in the library pulling out these books on dog behavior written by like PhDs. Right. And so, and I was back. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't realize how far back it goes. It does. And, and, you know, even as a child, I had these, what some, a couple of really looking back wild experiences because like, I remember I was walking to school one day because that was back in the day. You let your kids walk to school by themselves. Yeah. But anyway, (laughs) um, I was walking to school by myself. And this large, it was like a collie type dog, um, came at me barking. Nobody told me what you're supposed to do in that scenario. You know, like now we have these like safety programs, like be a tree and whatever. But nobody told me that. And I just remember thinking, all right, don't look at him. Just let him figure it out. And he didn't hurt me. He Whoa. just, he was like, rawr, 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 rawr. and he stopped and sniffed me and walked away. And I remember how thinking, you, how did good. you know to do that? Just instinct? I don't know. Yeah, I really don't know. And I read somewhere that a lot of people that work with animals, be it horses, dogs, or whatever, they don't even know what they're doing half of the time. And that's why it's so difficult to teach it to people. And I've spent now 15 years trying to figure out how to communicate that to my clients. How do I communicate things like, you are telling more to your dog with your body than your words. Or wow. teaching them English as a second language, like all those little catchphrases that I use, yeah. you know, really took time to figure out how to communicate that to people because I had a writing instructor tell me this once, our instinct with animals are all wrong generally. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, and, and that's not a bad thing. It's just that we're primates. So our instincts are derived from that. Right? I never and, thought about that. Apes yeah. and, you know, non-apes. <laughs> yeah. And dogs don't communicate that way and horses don't either. And so, you know, I mean, I did start really working with horses before I was working with dogs. And um, then I had to like, you know, grow up and get a real job. And <laughs> having gone- but You wrote the, your thesis on horses, right? Uh-huh. Stress yeah. in horses? And, yeah, so. yeah. I was obsessed with animal stress. I still am. Um, 
what causes animal stress. And so, so interesting. Now, Epona is, I forgot to mention, what it, who who was Epona? She was is Epona. The- a Celtic goddess, the benefactress of animals, and the and the Romans adopted her as a horse goddess. So you know, which was unusual, by the way, for the Romans to do that. They usually just wiped out the culture, wow. but uh, they they liked they liked her story so much they kept her. But um, and it just really spoke to me, and the whole benefactress idea. You know, the idea that I'm here to help. I love and that. And I'm I'm here to help create that bridge for people yeah. because you know, and I hear that all the time, like. I didn't know that's what the dog was trying to tell me. Right. Like even, you know, things like counter surfing, which is such a um pain of our existence, right? Dogs jump on the counter and they steal things. Well, <laughs> they're scavengers. Yeah. That's what they they're hardwired to do. And that. they get bored. I right. noticed my dog does that when you yeah. leave him too long and he gets bored. Yeah. So we yeah. create this sort of playground called the kitchen, right? <laughs> and they're like, well, let me see what I can find today. So it's, you know. <laughs> So we have to strike that balance with living with this creature, but honoring their instincts, but also making them somewhat civilized so that it can work. Yeah. You know, yes. So that's that's part of what informs what I do, you know, to try to create that bridge. Anyway, so so, yeah, so I went and then, you know, I got a degree in animal science because I loved animals. It made sense. So the science of animals and focusing on behavior and, you know, we looked at. Uh, performance horses like open jumpers and um just basically looking at certain stress parameters before and after competition trying to figure out whether the competition was stressful to them and you know it's really interesting because there's this idea that everything we do with these kind of work animals is terrible that's not necessarily so because what we found was that in the um the champions the ones that were seasoned, you know, open jumpers, they actually had lower stress levels after competition. They were like, that they was awesome. Kick out of it. Just yeah, like they liked app. it. Yeah, they liked it. But you yep. can sort of feel that. And people yep. talk about that, like owners of these animals. Yep. Like I see that in dog shows too. Like they, they like it. They like it. Oh yeah. Like when dogs, dog shows, when there's applause, they're like, yeah, thank they're you, like, I'm, thank you, thank I'm you. something thank you. like they yeah. get it. Yeah. yeah. It depends so on the animal. They're not but all. You have that to way. be careful, not all animals. Right, right. And, so interesting. And to, and, yet, and there's a right way. I always say there's a right way and a wrong way to do everything. You know. Right. So it, it, it's not an excuse for abuse. Right. And, you no. Know, so um. Good. Anyway, so I graduate with this degree, and and you know, there's a big demand for people. In, there's a big demand in biotech and pharma for people who can work with the animals. So they come at you and throw all this money at you, and you're like, oh. And it's it's <laughs> it's very seductive. And so I went down that road, but it wasn't really me. It really didn't make me happy. I mean, it paid the bills. It was really great that way. The money's wonderful. The people are fantastic. The intellectual stimulation is incredible. But it just wasn't enough. And that's why I walked away. Yeah. 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 Now, did that coincide with having a child? Like, did that just sort of bring it more like into focus for you? Yeah, it did. Because I think when you have, well, I should speak for myself. When I had my son, I felt like if I was going to be away from him, it had to be something that was for a really good reason. It, it had to be yeah. something very fulfilling. Yeah. For me. And so I'm like, I'm, and I'm sitting there in these meetings, bored out of my mind going, all right, so what am I doing? Uh, what am I doing here? Like, why, why, why am I doing this? Is there yeah. a better way? And it's going back to that grass is greener idea. Right. Yeah. Because it's like, okay, this, now I'm away from my child. I'm not doing something that's giving me joy. And there, there is a better place for me. And so I started thinking about it. And it was funny because my company in 1996, and this was actually before my son was born, they sent me out to San Diego to present a paper, you know, as you do. And um, after the, the conference, I took a few days just to a tourist in San Diego. And I went to the, the that famous dog beach in San Diego. Yeah. And I had this epiphany. I was like, oh, my God, doggy daycare we should have doggy daycares. No one had done it yet. No, it wasn't a thing. Oh and um, there was one, well, it wasn't a thing on the East coast. Let me put it that way. There was one doggy daycare, like in Oregon or something. And it really hadn't taken off like it is now. I mean, I then later realized it wasn't for me because I just, I didn't see it as, I didn't see a way to create a doggy daycare without creating a lot of stress for a lot of dogs. So, and make money at the same time. So I kind of let that go and I evolved into what I'm doing now. Right. 
is really funny because I think when you set out to start a business, you kind of have to be open to the idea of the pivot. Right? You think oh, I love you know, that. Yeah. You think you know what you want. You think that, okay, I have this idea. This is brilliant. And actually, a lot of people are making a lot of money with doggy daycare. So it does work. It's a business model. Yeah. But then you have to go, well, does it fit for me? Does it fit for my lifestyle? Does, you know, right. can I, and can I do this? And, you know, so things kind of evolved. And now I ended up with this more boutique approach where it's more personalized care. It really suits me better. And so it works for me. And explain for the listeners, like you have a really cool setup uh, for boarding. Yes. So, um, and, and it is um, really unique. Like we looked around, nobody else does this. Nobody else so, does this. Oh, so um, I'm in Hunterdon County. So as you find in Hunterdon County, we have two houses on our property. We have our house and a little cottage. And of course, you know, there was the idea of renting the cottage to humans. Like that's what normal people do. <laughs> <laughs> we had been through this process of like just, you know, interviewing potential tenants. And we were kind of like, God, this is kind of not resonating with any of these people. And I don't know that I want them 50 feet from my house and I have a little kid, you know, and all this stuff. That week that we were interviewing everyone, I got three phone calls because I'd already started a pet sitting business at that point. Mm -hmm. I got three phone calls asking me if I board dogs. And I remember standing in my driveway with my husband. I'm like, it's somebody else who wants to board dogs here. We both looked at the cottage and we looked at each other. We went, (laughs) wait a minute, we have an extra building. (laughs) That's so excellent. So every family, like whether it's one dog or two dogs, they get their own bedroom, right? But we keep families together, but we don't commingle different families. So they get their own bedroom. There's a bed. Then the um, pet parents can bring anything they want. So I have the gamut. Some people just hand me a bag of food and the dog. Other people, it's like they're bringing their child to camp. There are crates of beds and toys and, you know, mommy's things that, so they have the smell, like it's a whole thing, but whatever you want to do. That's what we do. And, and I create, while they're here, I create games for them. We go on long hikes in the woods and we just, you know, have a good time. I love so, this whole approach. And we should mention that you live on 17 beautiful acres yes. of yeah. land and woods. Yes. So it's dog heaven. It is dog heaven. And we have a great time and there's an outside run around space and an inside run around space because when it's raining, we want to have a place to play inside. Yeah. And so we have both. And, um, you know, so, yeah. So, and, you know, and we even, that's not even sometimes what the dogs want. Sometimes when I have older dogs and we are really ideal for the older dog, I, all the dog wants to do is sit on your lap and we'll do Aww. that too. You know, and that's you love too. that. I mean, yeah, I do. I love that you, I love that you give such customized care, but I also just want to say you just love the dogs. Yeah. I mean, that's like the big, like that's the secret sauce. It is. You love them and And they come there and they're taken care of, but somebody really loves them. Well, and, and it is, I think what has to, you have to love that component of it. Like whatever business you go into, there has to be that spark. And, you know, yeah. I, used to, you know, it, you have to have that burning desire to do the thing or be with the thing or whatever it is. And, you know, like, and, and the animals have been my kind of, I don't know, my thing for my whole life that I had to be with them. And so, and I just love that you figured it out. You yeah. combined, you always kept that yeah. animal, you just kept pivoting and combining, yep. but yep. keeping that central animal component. And I love that you said you have to be ready to pivot because I took this podcasting class and a lot of it was, they did teach us the technical stuff, but a lot of it was about mindset and how to not be afraid to jump in and how you don't have to be perfect and how you can be messy and be a B student. You don't have to be an A student. And so it made us start. And I started something I never would have started that way. And then they said, Hey, if it doesn't work out, you can pivot. And they just kept talking about that. So you just naturally grasped that. I I mean, some people have to take classes to learn this. Well, you know, we weren't, well, yeah, that's probably true, but we weren't rich, right? I mean, we didn't have like $500,000 to sink into starting a new business. And I remember thinking, well, what can I do with a very low startup cost? Well, you pets it. You have, I have a car. I have a phone. That's all you yeah. really need. That's you know? so cool. And, and I, you know, I, I just... I did it that way because that was, it was very easy to make my own hours to do what I wanted to do. And so that's where I started. And then always with the intention of expanding to other services, mm-hmm. but I you think grew it. Yeah, you grew it. Yeah. And grew the business. Yeah. But I do. So see how long that. has it been? It's been a while, right? 
over his, uh, 17 years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And you know, and I always knew this would take me to retirement. Like that was always the plan. So, you know, which it's, I think it, it will. Yeah. But you know, um, and I think I see that a, a lot in people that start businesses, they try to do too much at once, you yeah. know, and, and you can't do that. You have to yeah. take one thing, get really good at that and then really start moving on. I think anyway, that's what worked for me. Cause that was, you know, you remind me a little of my brother. He said, yeah, he said, you know, don't go out and buy swag or no, no, exactly. <laughs> I didn't buy swag until, um, I think it was eight years in. Yeah. But, all right. Yeah. Maybe I'll buy some swag. That's and even so that funny. I had to play around with because I, I got different things and people weren't that excited with them. And then, uh, I ended up settling on the lids for, for dog food cans. Oh my oh, God, cool. people love them. <laughs> yeah. You just never know. Right. But that's, that's, yeah, I mean, that is such a simple that's thing. You. Like you're yeah. flexible. And so you can always adapt. And I don't and think everyone important. has that. And I think that's kind of like what I keep seeing in entrepreneurs, people yeah. who become entrepreneurs, my brother too, he was always shifting, always adapting, always changing have to, yeah. his product and listening well, the, to the users, you yeah. know, to the, to the customers. Well, the world changes, right? The world doesn't it stay does. the same. So you it can't does. expect that if you start a business and do one thing that that will not change, that the world right. around you will not change. That's that's not reasonable. So, and you're dealing you know. with the public all the time. So you have to be sort of like you have to have an ear open to them. So absolutely. Tell what me about the want? training. Like, how did that develop? Like you how long well, have you that been goes doing back that? to that nine year old me in the library looking up how do and, you know, how do animals think now? And keep in mind, when I was in college and grad school, which was, you know, when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Um, I know, me too. <laughs> yeah, the idea that an animal had any kind of cognition was radical. It was a yeah. radical idea. Of course, now we're having seminars on, you know, dog emotions, like, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, we've come a long way. And of course, I mean, I don't think this will be a surprise to anyone. My hero was Jane Goodall growing up. I was going to say she realized it before everybody else. Oh, she revolutionized the field because, yeah. you no, know, uh, not for nothing, but the men would set up these um, observations or so-called observations of the wild animals. They would create artificial environments. And, and now we, you know, this is my big pet peeve about the whole dominance theory in dogs. And I, and I use the word theory very intentionally because it is just a theory and it's been debunked, but I'll put that aside for now. But, so what they did was they, this was like, uh, I think it was the thirties, but they took these adolescent male wolves, and threw them together. Couldn't be a more unnatural situation in the wolf world. Whoa. Right. So of course there was conflict and you know, conflict over resources. I mean that they set it up that way. And then they kind of extrapolated that one thing to all of dog behavior. I mean, it's appalling, really, if you think about it. And Goodall came along and said, no, 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 no. What you have to do is make yourself part of the background so you can see how the animals actually genuinely interact. And what we learned about wolves when people actually started doing that is that wolves operate on the level of family, not on this corporate alpha dynamic. I mean, it's really hysterical because we just imposed all of this human stuff on them. It doesn't yep. really apply. Dogs have, you know, compete over resources. Absolutely. Is there such a thing as leadership in the dog world? Sure. But you're not competing for leadership with your dog. That's ridiculous. No, that's I can't so interesting because yeah. we've all been told that. Oh yeah. 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 yeah because we just well, repeat it. Yeah. Conrad Lawrence, who is revered in the in the animal behavior world, you know, and you know my thing about him. I mean, you know, he wrote a letter to his mother about how excited he was being accepted into the Nazi party. So, but everybody glosses Ouch. over that part. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but it's actually relevant because they had that whole idea of superior, inferior humans. Power over. Yeah. Power over. Yeah. So they had to like impose that on the animal world. But that's so interesting. I think so often that happened mm -hmm. because I remember. Oh, reading a book by Marilyn French. She did this big fat nonfiction book. She's a novelist, but she also did this nonfiction book called Beyond Power. Oh yeah, yeah. And book. it was men, women, men and morals. Yep. And she made a really good case for the fact that 
that we do that, that we impose yeah. this corporate structure as yeah. we're looking at the, na- she started with the animal world yeah. and she said, you know, it's race silly. is pretty rare in the animal world, yeah. yet men see it all the time. Yeah. Like men, yeah. scientists see it all the time because yeah. they don't understand. Yep. And, it's you so know, fascinating. It is. And the bottom line though, is that, you know, Jane Goodall learned more about primate behavior, than all the men that came before her. I mean, she really cracked it open, you know, as far as the, the field itself and, and, and expanded the understanding. And we're kind of in that um, space now, I think with dogs, there are actually research institutes that are looking at you know, dogs versus versus wolves. And that's the other fascinating part of this, because, you know, we, even on TV, they're always having commercials about how your dog has an inner wolf. Sure, that is true. Mm-hmm. You no, know, they did evolve from some wolf like creature. But you know what? A dog will look to a human for help in solving a puzzle. And will follow many dogs will naturally follow your point. To something a wolf is like, no, I got this. <laughs> a wolf doesn't have that that built-in connection dogs come with like a computer port to make a connection with the humans they've been wolves wired. don't have that so to compare wolf behavior to dog behavior is flawed on that level too that's like really interesting because we all do that we all repeat that oh wolf he's like a wolf and the, but there's been so many years you know, and so much breeding since that time. Right. And selection. Yeah. And we've selected for the dogs that want to work. And of course there's a, you know, a great variety of dogs and right. you know, there's, you know, everything from the border collie to the chihuahua. So, you know, those are not the same in any stretch of the imagination, but still they're not, neither of them are wolves. Yeah. You know? not so at all. that's kind of, I, I, that is a bit of my soapbox and I do try to deliver it gently to people because I don't want to rock their world too much because, yeah. you know, th- then you don't create an atmosphere for learning. Right. But I love this. I had this one client a couple of years ago and I always use him because I just, I adored this man. He was, you know, he was an older man and the, the um, couple, it was an older couple and, you know, they had always had labs like in their eighties at this point, And they get this very rambunctious lab puppy because they always had labs, right? But now they're 80. So they're like, <laughs> yeah, okay. But anyway, so whatever. So um, so I go in to do the lesson. First thing he says to me, I want to know how to correct this dog. You need to tell me how to punish him. And, and this is my pat answer. I'm like, oh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. I, I just have to put that aside for a minute. I need to tell you some other things first, but you know, we'll come around to that. Well, we did three lessons and the dog came, was doing beautifully. And at the end of the third lesson, he goes, oh, just realize something. I don't have to correct her. He just knows what to do. I'm like, yeah, how about that? Oh my God. Isn't that great? (laughs) Your magic. See, you did your magic. Yeah. But it's just, you know, I don't tell him he's wrong. Yeah. I don't tell them they're wrong. Right. Just say, let's look at it this way for a minute. Then we'll go to that way. Let's try it this way just for a minute and see if that'll work. Because, and I always say, I really prefer to tell the dog what I want before I start punishing them punishing them for making mistakes. Right. Right. So, you know, and this is starting to happen in the horse world, which really gives me joy. Good. Because one of the reasons why I walked away from that world was because it is so cruel, so much abuse. There are some people around the world doing some amazing things right now in just communicating to the horse about what we want them to do for us. And satisfying their needs in any given situation and it's it's really wonderful to watch there's I mean, a gentler great. approach yeah it is a gentleness yeah and some people are uncomfortable with that but you know yeah. i think eventually we'll get there and it's just and you know i gotta say the dogs themselves taught me so much of that you know and it wasn't just the studying and the reading because i you remember roscoe yeah. i got this rhodesian ridgeback because he was about to become aggressive. His family couldn't handle him. He kept running away and terrorizing people on the golf course that was next door to their oh house. Oh my God. So, yeah. And they were being threatened with lawsuits. I mean, it was bad. And, you know, when he came to me, I was still in that kind of old school dog training paradigm. You know? And I'm going to like correct this dog when he does something wrong. And one day he came at me. Okay. And I remember thinking, huh? guy's gonna fight back 
have to do something different. Now, at the same time, this is back when I was, you know, doing all these these seminars and workshops on this whole kind of positive reinforcement training. And I'm like, all right, well, let's let's use these new new for me techniques. And um, he just awesome. He was like, he, he went from stop hurting me. Like, what do you want, boss? What can I do for <laughs> you know, and like it's so. It, tell us a little bit how that happens, like just a little bit, so we can envision. Well, what you did. Yeah. So what happens is, you know, you start with the dog just giving them a reward for the most simplest thing. You know, I'm going to ask you to look at me. If you look at me, I will mark that as something that's good and I will give you a reward for it. Oh, cool. Ask nothing else of you. Just look at me. And of course, go, you know, that ties into their natural desire to make a connection with you. So, you know, start there. And then when you start then asking more of them, like give me a sit or a down or, you know, jump through a hoop, whatever. No, they're, they're, they're ready to do it because they know that if I show you how to do something and you do it, you get a reward. They're ready for that. No. And it's really simple, but it's not easy because. Yeah. You I've have noticed to- a lot of the stuff you tell me, it isn't simple to be consistent and to be, right. yeah. you know, to really apply it, but it, there's, a, be, yeah, there's a, a big calm. payoff. Yeah. And the, the best one of the um, one of my mentors, I, I, I remember I was so blown away by her because she had no extraneous body movements when she worked with the dog. Wow. Like if she was going to lure the dog <laughs> into position, that was the only thing moving on her. Right. And I had to work on that because, you know, Italian, we're waving arms. <laughs> all the time. And that's very I mean, it's very confusing for a dog. Because if you're trying to communicate with a dog and you're waving your arms all, all over the place, it's like you've got crazy music on in the background. And, uh-huh. and you know, and so you're trying to talk, but or or there's a cacophony, like they can't figure out what you're trying to say. And, you know, she really <laughs> taught me that. I mean, she was amazing. And, um, you know, and that that is what I find a lot of times when I'm working with someone, I have to work on because they're not even aware that they're doing. Yeah, it's a special kind of thing. I mean, we don't have yeah. that awareness. So it sounds like you have to train the, the oh, parent, yeah. the dog oh, parents. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and that's cool because then they're happier with their dog. So it works. Well, yeah. And because I'll tell you when, and I go back to Roscoe, when we started work actually working together and actually achieving things together, both of us were so much happier. It wasn't just him, it was me too. I mean, it and was there's like so a falling joyful. in love that happens. Yep. There's like a yep. trust and a falling yeah. in love. It's like she's my buddy, you know? Yeah. 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 And trust is such a huge part of the human dog relationship and like when you're working with a rescue dog or a traumatized dog building that trust again very simple but really not easy for primates i mean sometimes all it you can do is sit there yeah you don't talk to the dog you don't look at the dog you don't feed the dog you don't touch the dog and i know so many people that have such a hard time with that i would have a hard time with that yeah. i'm always touching dogs yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know and you just have to sit there and let the dog figure out that you know, they can trust you. Yeah. And that's how you teach them that. You don't teach them that by petting them because that's not necessarily pleasant. Right. right. They don't so, they might not want that. Or especially yeah. hugs. Oh People no, hugs and yeah. hug dogs. Well, the no, weird thing is no. greyhounds like hugs, a certain kind yes. of hug. Okay. So yeah. that's just weird. Right. They like to lean on you and then they like to be hugged because it feels like they're leaning. Hounds in like, general. But you can't hold them too tight. That's what I right. noticed with our greyhound. I've always held them like I've always held them like I, you can leave anytime you want. I can let you go. It's no problem. Yep. But um, yep. yeah, it's I mean, hard. And dogs are all so different. It's so. I have true. a dog right now who does not like. He does not like hugs. Yeah, and people are like that too. Yeah, my son-in-law does not like hugs. Yeah, he said yeah. the only person he likes to hug is my daughter. <laughs> Think about that. Like we know that this is a thing in humans. But why not in dogs? Not every dog wants I to be never hugged. thought about it. I was like, yeah. all dogs love to be, you know, no. touched by me. Yes. Yeah. Well, right. And, you know, and believe me, I, I I wish I had a dime for every time that happened to me where I'm working with a dog in a town and people come up and they're like, can I pet him? Well, no, he's training. Oh, but dogs love me. All right. This has nothing to do with you. <laughs> <laughs> do they really say that? But dogs love all me? the time. I get that. They don't get the point. The point is not that dogs love you or don't love you. The point yeah. is I'm training him. Right. So and he's learning, him. right. He's learning to be comfortable in this really scary environment and yeah. you coming into his face is not helping him at all. Yeah, in fact, it's understand. hurting him. Yeah. And, it's so, and it, 
yeah, the, the things that people think, I remember a long time ago, we were at Knobles, which is like an outdoor amusement park in the woods in oh, Pennsylvania. Fun. Yeah, and We were with Chrissy, our standard poodle. Ah, uh, yes. She loved everybody, right? And this little girl came up and before we could do anything, oh, yeah. yeah, she grabbed Chrissy's snout and pulled it towards her ah! and kissed her. And I was having like a heart attack. Chrissy, you know, put up with it yeah. because and she that's was that kind key. of dog. It's but exactly I had to put up with it. That's the perfect I way to phrase it. Had a heart attack. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God, if she had done this with another dog, and she did it so fast, I couldn't do anything. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I and I real and I've also noticed with horses too, because I, you know, I didn't have as much horse experience as you, but I did have horses growing up and I know not to touch them head on. Right. But so many people do that. Right. So there's a lot of you, behaviors that you have to work on when you're it's it's about our eyes. I mean, it's their head on. That's what we are. We're head on. Right. Yeah. And not all right. animals work that way. That's and so you know, true. it's just um, understanding where they are. And that's what I always say. I work where the dog is. I also work where the human is. I start where both of them are. I know? love that whole idea that it's deeper than just a few, you know, things that we know about dogs. It's a relationship and you it's work on the relationship. Yeah. The relationship is everything because, you know, at the end of the day, and I mean, I say this as a trainer, I don't think it matters if your dog can hold it down for 30 minutes. I think what matters is if you worked out a way to live with your dog. Right. right? So if you have a, a, a pug, you may not need the dog to know it down. It doesn't right. matter. You know? Now, if you right. have, you know, a real leggy greyhound, maybe a down is, is a skill that they really need to know, you yeah. know? Right. It's not a one size fits all. It really isn't. And everybody's different. No, that's and so, so cool. that's what I try to do. I try to make it work. You know? I do love that, and it also sounds like it's endlessly fascinating because it's always different. Oh, it's always different, and yeah, you know, it, it, because it's not just the dogs; it's the people, and I get to meet a lot of really cool people. And you know, I mean, it, it's and it's it's it, we laugh a lot because it's just so fun. You know? It is, and, and I do try to make it fun too. I mean, I I do make an effort to make it light and happy because it's supposed to be fun. Training your yeah. dog. Living with the dog is supposed to be fun. Yeah. It's not oh, supposed to be a chore. Very good point. You no. Know? I mean, yeah, if you have a police dog, sure, maybe it's supposed to be a, do- a chore. But you no, know, <laughs> those people, it's not, though, because those people, they both want to do the work, right? But, um, yeah. but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really important to me to make that happen. You know? And so do it one dog at a time. <laughs> I am super impressed how you made this, you know, like, well, you remind me of my brother. You're like a, a 17 year overnight success. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it does take a while. Actually, but, it probably um, goes back more than that because I mean, even in grad school, I was like, I don't think I'm not out to work for other people. Yeah. Like I sort of knew that. Yeah. But, you know, I was, I was like, I always say I was seduced by the pharma and the biotech world because it was really yep. interesting and, and lucrative and you know, really kind of, fun people so that was it was easy to fall into it was very you launched from there i mean you got some stuff out of that you know it's good to and also i think it helps you relate to some of your clients because you were in that world you know well yeah well and that and that that has a downside too because i have um i think i've broken most of them of this but at the beginning people would call me and go my dog just swallowed a popsicle what should i do okay i'm not a vet you need to call (laughs) your vet I can't, by law, I can't tell you what to do. It is illegal for me to practice veterinary medicine without a license. So see, people hang just up. trust you so much. That, exactly. Yeah. You know, well, you know, and they know, well, you know, she worked in, in, in animal science, so she knows. It's like, it doesn't yeah. work that way. So, but I mean, you are able to do extra things that regular yes, pet sitters don't sure. do. Yeah. Like absolutely. you can give injections and you can yep. administer medicine. And, oh, sure. So I'm that's like an extra of kind of cool set of things you can do so how do people get in touch with you on social media or what's your website oh okay so on uh facebook it's epona pet care and um i have i do have a uh instagram account but i don't i don't really so let's just focus on the facebook (laughs) okay i don't don't really i am remiss in my instagram i i need to do more there so yeah the facebook is epona pet care um, and then you can text me or call me and I do have eponapetcare.com, which is my website. Okay. And epona is E P O N A. Correct. Right? Yep. 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 Great. Yep. Well, cool. is there anything else that you would like to share with people about how to be an entrepreneur or how it happens? Um, just spend the time before you leap to try to learn as much as you can about the thing you want to do. 
That's cool. The, the pre-work you, is important. You spent time with SBA. Like you went to special oh, yeah. um, I, people yep. at the, I remember that. Yeah. You I were went going to, the, to um, I, the community college and they yep. had volunteers. And they have there's so many resources. There really are. And I sat down with this woman who like, they have specific, I forget what the coaches, I think they call them. They have specific people for your specific field. So Wow. Right. So I sat down, um, the SBA set me up with a woman who does animal businesses. Right. And so I sat down with her and talked about what I want to do and where I want to go with it. And like everything from what I should charge to what kind of insurance I should get. Like they really help you out. What are the pitfalls? Like that's the kind of thing. And then there are general business th- uh, classes that you could take because I wasn't a business major. I never did any kind of counting or anything like that, you know, so there are yeah, things that are, yeah, the small business administration does provide a lot of guidance. They're wonderful. At least so 20 years like ago, you, they were. You did, you didn't just leap in, you, you tried to prepare. And I think that's a yeah. really good point. Yeah. yeah you have to, well, right. The chance favors the prepared mind, right? I mean, it's, oh yeah, it's, I love it's, that. It's, yeah. yeah. Fortune favors the bold. The, yeah. Yeah. But no, but you have but the to prepare. Do, yeah. You got to do your homework. How many people in your area are doing what you want to do? Yeah. Right. So if you want to start a business, I mean, let's say you want to open a coffee shop. How many coffee shops are around the place where you want to build a coffee shop? I mean, you know, maybe you don't too want many. To be, right. You got to yeah, know. There might be. You might want to go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's important. How many people in your area have dogs? Like I actually went to the county library and figured out how many oh. dogs are there in Hunterdon County. Like, what is my client base? And what do you want your client base to be? Like, do you want to take all comers? I didn't. I didn't want to take all comers. And I did that very early on. I did it one at a time. And then I realized I needed to put information on my website. Like I did not want to use prong collars and electric collars. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not judging people, but I didn't want to do that. Your so, approach is different, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just me. So I would call people. I remember this woman calling. <laughs> she got, had a four month old puppy and she, you know, we, we, she wanted daily dog walks and we went to the whole thing, you know, the prices, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so then I, I always ask, so what equipment are you using on the dog right now? And she said, a prong collar said, oh, I'm so sorry I've wasted your time. I don't use them. You'll have to call somebody else. No judgment. Just move along. Yeah. Well, it was very important to her to get my buy-in on what she was doing. Oh. And I'm like, I don't know why you need my approval. I don't feel the need to give it to you. Just move along. Well, finally, I had to find someone to recommend to her because she wouldn't hang up the phone. She kept arguing with me. And she wouldn't give up the prong collar. That amazes no, no, no. me. Yeah. She kept saying, she kept trying to defend it. And I'm like, I'm too old to have this fight, this discussion with you. Yeah. I know what I do. This isn't what I do. That's all yeah. this is about. It's not about you being right or wrong. It's just not what I do. And uh, boy, that was a tough sell. So yeah, she I'm, didn't like to be told that. Some people, it's just personal. You know, they they just, their wall comes up. Well, right. And it's hard to deliver that information without the person feeling judged. Right. Right. I mean, how else, you know, if you say, even if you say to them, well, that's not what I do. Well, why not? What's wrong with it? That's the, that's the reflex. There's what's a judgment. Wrong? Yeah. Well, what's wrong with it? It doesn't work for me. You know, and that, that yeah. is true. Like you need, I mean, there are two things you need for a prong collar to work. You need a lot of upper body strength, which I don't have. And you need to be willing to hurt your dog. If you don't inflict pain, it won't work. That's why you see people being dragged down main street, a prong collar. Because they didn't pull it hard enough to make the dog yell. So, so when you that's, just that's when you not say your that, philosophy, yeah, right, it's just not when, your philosophy, right? But when you say to the person, "Well, are you willing to inflict pain on your dog?" That comes with automatic judgment, and it's like, "Well, no, it's just a fact. It's yeah. not. I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you that's how this works." Yeah. Oh, so it's it's really funny, and it cracks really me attached. up. Like when when we know so much more about something, and someone else is trying to like, oh, yeah, like. I'll show you. It's just kind of crazy, right? Well, the internet thought it out. You thought it out. You know your stance. It's not like something you can be swayed from somebody who's not an expert, right? Well, I know, but the internet has added a whole new dimension to that because you know now they go to Google (laughs) and that tells them what to think. And if it contradicts with what you said, then you're no longer an expert. And I don't care. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Then go to that person. There are plenty of people out there. You know, we'll and that that's way. another great thing too. If you don't resonate with me, find someone you do. It's oh, not, yeah. 
you know, it's not a big deal. There's plenty of people doing similar work. And if yep, I'm not your not, girl, yeah, I'm busy. I'm somebody who is. Yeah. I'm a busy person. I, I'm real yeah. good with what I have. And it's not a reflection on me at all if you don't want to hire me because you don't want to. <laughs> you know, it's it use the services that I offer. It's sort of like if you go to a hair salon and person only shaves heads, you want a long haircut, then you go to somebody else, right? right. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. But, but for you, it isn't because you've removed your ego from it. Well, probably, yeah. Yeah, and you're yeah. just like, hey, you know, it's this way. Yeah, well, it is what it is. I could talk to you for like nine hours. Well, I, yeah, I, I learned this. stuff I didn't even know and I know you very well. Oh, that's funny. So that was just really cool. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. So much. Right. This was and fun. I'll put your um. I'll put your your info in my show notes. Okay. On the episode. There's like a little show notes section. Awesome. And um, you know, maybe we'll have you back with my brother. That would be really kind of fun. Yeah, that would be we could fun. sort of have a like a back and forth. But About thank you for sharing, Christina Rusinello. You're welcome. <laughs> have a great day. You too. Bye. Thanks.